even for the ancient Egyptians, the origin of the country's fifth dynasty was shrouded in myth and legend. The version of the story that we have was written down in a document known as the Westcar Papyrus, believed to have been created around 1600 BC. The text contains five stories that may have been composed around 500 years earlier during Egypt's 12th dynasty. It's hard to tell because much of the text is missing, making our understanding of it a bit incomplete. One of the stories tells about the founding of the 5th dynasty. It's told by Jeji, a magician, or perhaps priest, at the court of Khufu, the 4th dynasty king who commissioned one of Egypt's most iconic structures, the Great Pyramid of Giza. Jeji states that three yet unborn children of a certain lady, Rowejadet, the wife of the high priest of Ra at Heliopolis, will become kings. Khufu at first is quite unnerved, but Jeji tells him not to worry, as both his son and grandson, Kafre and Menkaure respectively, will be kings before that happens. The first to be born is Userkaf, who is one cubit long, with firm bones, limbs made of gold, and a headdress made of lapis lazuli. The next two, his brothers Sahure and Nefer Irkare, are born in a similar fashion. Heaven rejoices, and a new age in Egypt begins. Of course, archaeology rejects this story, but the tale does seem to confirm some changes that were occurring in Egyptian society at the time. One of these was the advent of a new royal family from the city of Heliopolis, which means City of the Sun. Its original Egyptian name was Iyunu. This is significant because Heliopolis was a major cult center of the sun god Ra. So it should be no surprise that a new royal family, starting with a king named Userkaf, would make Ra their patron deity. The dynasty that ancient Egypt's chroniclers put Userkaf at the helm of is known to us today as Dynasty V. Given the archaeological evidence, Egyptologists are convinced that the kings of the 5th dynasty were not necessarily from a completely new family, but perhaps a branch of the old one. Most agree that Userkaf was the grandson of the 4th dynasty's third king, Jedefre, through his mother's side, though who his mother was is debated. Many scholars believe that it may have been a woman named Kentkawes. However, Ken Kawes may have also been his wife and the daughter of the 4th dynasty's 5th king, Menkaure. The point, though, is that Userkaf had strong familial ties to Egypt's 4th dynasty, which may have made him a strong contender for the throne upon the death of that dynasty's last ruler, Shepseskef. Userkaf is believed to have reigned for the seven years between 2498 to 2491 BC. It's a relatively short reign, and little is recorded with regard to the political developments that occurred during that time. Like his predecessors, Userkaf is best known for his building projects. In this case, not pyramids, but his sun temple near the site of Abu Sir, about 15 kilometers south of modern Cairo. The name of the temple was Nekin Ra, which roughly translates to the stronghold of Ra, as in the god Ra, who was also the patron deity of the dynasty. Unfortunately, the temple is in complete ruins, and so badly damaged that archaeologists have had trouble determining its actual layout, though they have found evidence of a causeway and an obelisk on the premise. Some of the artwork that has been uncovered at the site is also extremely impressive, including a large granite head of Userkaf that, with the exception of the Sphinx, is the largest stone portrait from the Old Kingdom period. Unlike his fourth dynasty predecessors, Userkaf chose not to be laid to rest at Giza, but instead within the royal cemetery of Saqqara, where he had a pyramid built for himself not too far from that of Djoser's famous step pyramid. It was smaller than those of his predecessors, but lavishly decorated. 
Nearby are pyramids that Userkev built for his wives. Userkev was succeeded by his half-brother, Sahure, also pronounced Sahura. According to the Palermo Stone, he ruled for 14 years. The same document, along with other royal annals, show that Sahure donated a number of offerings and land to various temples, especially in Lower Egypt. Like Userkaf, he also constructed a sun temple, but its remains have yet to be found. Sahure's annals mention campaigns into the eastern deserts, the Sinai, the mysterious land of Punt, and Libya. There were also trade relations with Nubia, Sahure was laid to rest in a relatively small pyramid at the site of Abu Sir. Sahure was succeeded by his brother, Nefir Irakare, whose name was later written with the surname Gakai. His approximately 10 year reign was pretty stable, and he also donated a lot of land and funds from taxes to various temples, including his own sun temple the latter of which has so far not been conclusively identified. As for foreign relations, it's known that his government had at least a trading relationship with Nubia. We know about this partly because many court officials during his reign had their biographies or autobiographies inscribed on the walls of their tombs, which detailed some of their responsibilities as well as certain activities that they carried out for the king. Nefer Irkare's pyramid is also at Abu Sir, and it's the largest of any at that necropolis. In fact, it's roughly the same size as Menkaure's pyramid at Giza, though not as in good condition. There's actually very little information on Nefer Kare's son and likely successor, Shepseskare. Some have theorized that due to his short reign, his may be one of the several unfinished pyramids found between Abu Sir and Giza, but there's not enough evidence to confirm this. Most estimates of Shepseskare's reign are that he ruled for seven years, but there are some who believe that his time on the throne may have been only two years, with Egyptologist Miroslav Werner, who specializes in the 5th dynasty, stating that his time as Egypt's king may have actually been only a few months. This may be why his sun temple and pyramid, assuming that he had time to plan for one, have so far either not been identified, or perhaps were never even started. Another one of Neferirkare's sons, and the brother of Shepseskare, was Neferrefre, who also went by the name Ranefere. Like his brother, there are many questions about his life, and the time that he spent upon the throne. Like his brother, and depending upon which Egyptologist you follow, he may have reigned for seven or two years. Most now believe that it was the shorter of the two because his incomplete pyramid has been discovered, along with an inscription stating that construction of it was stopped during the second year of his reign. Neferefre nevertheless was buried there, and the incomplete pyramid renovated into a mastaba, probably by his brother and successor, Niusere Ini. At about 30 years, Niusere Ini's reign was considerably longer than those of his two predecessors. Due to this, there's more recorded about him. Egypt appears to have been both peaceful and prosperous during his reign, as there are not only several buildings credited to Niusere, but he also went through significant efforts to restore and maintain the structures built by his predecessors. For himself, he commissioned at least three pyramids and several smaller ones for his queens and other members of his family, which are all at the necropolis of Abu Sir. In addition, his sun temple, known as the Joy of the Heart of Ra, is the largest and best preserved of the Fifth Dynasty kings. From the remains of the obelisk and the scatterings of artwork left behind, it must have been a spectacular sight during its day. The expansion of the government's reach and bureaucracy during Neosere's reign resulted in a more decentralized state. The governors of the various provinces, 
instead of residing at or close to the capital of Memphis, were sent to live within their respective territories. Though reporting directly to Neo Sere, they acted and lived like kings within their areas of jurisdiction. In fact, some of the funerary complexes that they had built for themselves were more lavish than those of several kings of Egypt's previous dynasties. Though perhaps not intended to be, these positions in many cases became hereditary, which established dynasties of nomarchs. As time went on, many of these families grew extremely powerful, which in later times would cause issues. But, at least during Neo Sere's reign, this system hadn't yet become a problem, and was actually needed in order to keep Upper and Lower Egypt unified. As for foreign affairs, there doesn't seem to have been any conflict with Egypt's neighbors, and commerce carried on between Egyptian ports in the Delta and the Levantine coast, especially with the city of Byblos. There was also a good deal of mining activity in the Sinai region. Overall, Niusere must have been a popular king, because his funerary cult lived on for centuries, well into the period of Egyptian history known as the New Kingdom. Niusere was succeeded by his son, Menkauhor, who continued the policies of his father. Despite the fact that there's a statue of Menkauhor wearing said festival garb, implying that he reigned for at least 30 years, the current archaeological evidence that we have seems to indicate that it was only eight. Menkauhor is believed to have been buried at what has become known as the Headless Pyramid at Saqqara, something that was more or less agreed upon by Egyptologists only in 2008. His Sun Temple, which is referenced in various texts, has so far not been discovered. Jejkare also known as Jejkare Isesi, ruled for 40 years. His time on the throne was one of change, at least in comparison to his predecessors. For one, there's no record anywhere of him building a sun temple, which is a bit odd given his dynasty's devotion to the sun god, Ra. He also reformed the tax system, which brought in more revenue, more often, into state coffers. This was needed to support the growing bureaucracy. More positions, special titles, and new departments were created to help oversee the government's daily operations. Some of these titles included the Controller of the Two Thrones, He Who is at the Head of the King, the Master of Secrets and Royal Decrees, He of the Curtain, the Master of Largesse, Overseer of Upper Egypt, Overseer of the foreign country, and so on. There was now no such thing as small government in Egypt. While by this time, dynasties of nomarchs in the provinces had been formed, this also became the case with many important ministerial positions. For example, the role of vizier, which was in the hands of the Tahotep family, was passed down from father to son during Jedkare's long reign. Their tombs have been discovered at Saqqara, while those of other important officials and their families have been uncovered at Giza. With so many families amassing more power, estates, and fortunes of their own, the king's absolute hold on the provinces, and even some sections of the government, weakened. This doesn't necessarily mean that there was any major conflict. The king needed capable administrators to keep the realm together, and none of these subordinates were able to mass enough power on their own to directly challenge him. Many scholars believe that the rise of so many influential Egyptian families with their own interests and agendas may have eventually led to the erosion of the central government's grip on the state, as well as the disorder that resulted during Egypt's first intermediate period. For now, though, things on the home front were stable. After a long and prosperous reign, Jejkare was laid to rest in a pyramid, complete with a mortuary temple at Saqqara. Finally, we come to the 9th 
and last king of the 5th dynasty, Zhejkare's son, Unas, also known as Wenis. The Turin canon, or king list, states that he ruled for 30 years, and archaeological evidence seems to support this. His pyramid and burial complex are at Saqqara, not too far from the steppe pyramid of Djoser. Although largely in ruins, the layout of Unis' pyramid complex has been pretty well preserved. What's really impressive about the structure is not what's outside and surrounding the pyramid, but inside. In 1881, the now-famed French Egyptologist Gaston Maspero entered the interior of the pyramid and discovered something quite spectacular. The antechamber and walls of the tomb were covered by long columns of inscriptions. Today, we call these pyramid texts. Basically, these writings, some called them spells, were inscribed around the tomb in order to aid the transfer of the deceased, in this case Unas, to the afterlife, where he would be amongst the gods. In later periods, such texts adorned the walls of not just other kings, but also a few queens and some important nobles. Though the first time we see such texts is in Unas's tomb, Egyptologists have determined that the language or dialect of the texts dates from a time long before his reign, and so it's believed that they'd been passed down over generations and committed to stone only at the very end of the 5th dynasty. For all we know, Unis's reign was similar to those of his predecessors. Nomarchs and government ministers seem to have increased their power, which can be seen by their elaborate tombs throughout the country. Though the worship of the sun god Ra continued, especially amongst members of the royal family, the popularity of Osiris, god of the afterlife and renewal, increased greatly amongst the general population. When you think about it, it's not very surprising. During Egypt's very early history, it was really only the rulers and perhaps members of their immediate entourage who had the opportunity to enjoy the benefits of an afterlife and immortality. Later, this privilege was extended to certain ministers and notable officials, for example, Imhotep. However, by Egypt's fifth dynasty, even the common people had the possibility of obtaining everlasting life depending upon their conduct on earth. This may have been the reason for the growing popularity of Osiris amongst the masses during the fifth dynasty. Despite his many years on the throne and numerous wives, Unas failed to secure a male heir. The problem of succession was essentially resolved when a certain Teti, who was married to one of Unas's daughters, became Egypt's next ruler. According to ancient Egypt's chroniclers, he was the first king of the country's next great ruling house, Dynasty VI. More on him in the next chapter of Ancient Egypt, Dynasty by Dynasty. Stay tuned. Anyway, I hope that you're really enjoying this series, and thanks so much for watching. If you'd like to take a more in-depth look at pyramids and other ruins from the 5th dynasty, check out the channel Ancient Sites in the videos on Abu Sir and Saqqara. I'd also like to thank them for allowing me to use some of their clips in this program. I'd also really like to thank Grandkeg69, Yaf de Graf, Pasta Frola, Michael Lewis, Danielle Allen, Danny Van Eck, Wenix TV, Robert Morgan, Frank, Tim Lane, Sebastian Hurtado Correa, Franz Robbins, Brendan Redman, Faridun Dadachanji, Jimmy Daruwala, Sher Cam, Farhad Kama, and all of the channel's patrons on Patreon for helping to support this and all future content. Check out the benefits to being a Patreon member, and if you'd like to join, feel free to click the link in the video description. You can also follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as listen to special audio programs on the History with Sai podcast. Thanks again, and stay safe.